So first I'm gonna start with Alexa. Can you tell us what, who you are, where you're from, what you're doing here? Yeah, of course. Hi everyone, I'm Alexa McKinley. I am a regulatory affairs manager at the National Rural Health Association. So I pretty much handle all of our regulatory advocacy and our regulatory agenda. Um, What's that mean, Alexa, your regulatory? That sounds pretty high and mighty. That sounds awful official. Um, I wouldn't say that, but I'll take it. So <laughs> let's say um, the administration, like the Department of Health and Human Services puts out a proposed rule. I lead NRHA's response um, commenting on that proposed rule and I track on pretty much all of the, I would say, policy updates that come out of the executive branch versus like Capitol Hill. Gotcha. Gotcha. Thanks. Uh, so you got to be pretty smart to get that job. Ryan, uh, I'm coming up on you next. Who are you? And what are you doing here? Well, hey, good afternoon. Thanks for having me. Ryan Thorne. I'm the state director for USDA Rural Development in West Virginia. Um, West and at USDA Rural Development, I always like to say we're advocates for investors in and partners to rural communities and the people, businesses, and organizations within those communities. So at Rural Development, whether you're in Guam or Georgia or Wyoming or West Virginia or Maine to Puerto Rico, we have a footprint uh, in every state, and that's pretty rare when it comes to a federal agency having a, a presence in uh, all states and uh, territories. So Ryan, are you saying that there's one of you in all of the 50 US states and territories or? So there that? are, uh, there are 48 state directors. Uh, so like uh, we have some that are combined, uh, New Hampshire, Vermont uh, is combined into one, uh, Maryland, Delaware, um, our Hawaii state director also handles Guam. Uh, so uh, there are 48 state directors uh, in West Virginia. I lead a staff of approximately 45 employees Whoa. across uh, 11 offices. Wow. Okay. Well, I'm going to come back to you and see what all those 45 people do. <laughs> I'm like, this sounds like a whole bunch of paychecks. We need to get, we need to see what, what else people are doing for those paychecks. Um, Zeb, I know that you're driving with your family uh, on today. And so I want to thank you, but also want to thank your family for letting you give us some time. <laughs> Uh, with you today. Uh, can you tell us what you do and why you why, why you accepted this invitation? Well, it's a, it's very important to me to be part of this conversation. I'm Zeb Smathers, uh, mayor of Kent, North Carolina. Um, that's in the mountains, about 20 minutes west of Asheville. Uh, born and raised there. My three-year-old son, he's the ninth generation. And I went to Duke undergrad law school at Carolina and came home and practiced law. And then I came back and, and ran for office. Uh, Canton is a mill town. Uh, it's a paper mill. Uh, we're one of the last blue collar towns left in the state. Uh, that was till about a month ago uh, when we received news that uh, the place would be, the paper mill would be shutting down, losing 1,100 jobs. And that's really been the identity. Uh, 10 years ago, we had nothing, no restaurants, no businesses, and we fought our way back. Uh, and then about two years ago, we suffered massive flooding. I uh, lost uh, six people, completely destroyed our downtown river area. I lost my town hall, my police department, my fire department. Uh, and it just, you know, every time we sort of, you know, we get back up, we get knocked uh, down. And so now we have to take on our greatest challenge, losing 1,100 jobs. Uh, and so that's been heartbreaking, uh, but we're finding our way. It's, it's tough times, but we have tougher people. And I'm just mm -hmm. blessed to be part of a good team leading us out of it. Well, thank you, Zeb. And that's a, a big part of the reason that I, I really wanted us to have this conversation today is that, you know, we typically have conversations here, certainly about what's happening in Appalachia uh, overall, but we usually are talking about substance use disorder, hepatitis, HIV. But I think that this is one of the most critical things uh, in our region of the world is lost jobs, lost opportunity, because I believe lost jobs, lost opportunity, and lost hope lead to the other pieces of the syndemic that I was talking about, uh, behavioral health, substance use disorder, and others. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, I think that I, you know, you know, listen, if I if I had the money under the mattress, I'd buy I'd buy the paper mill, but I don't. 
Um, you know, I think I'd be a good paper mill owner there, Zeb, and I'd be good to the employees. Don't ask my employees if they think that, but just go with the flow on that one, okay? <laughs> um, yes, ma'am. But, but, you know, so Zeb, and, and I'm going to come back because I want to go back down kind of now in reverse order, right? I'm going to come to you next and then uh, Alexa after that. So Zeb, tell me, like I, my last understanding is that there was some additional conversation about the, the paper mill maybe staying there. Uh, is it solidified? Are they gonna go? Are they gonna stay? And where do 11,000 people go for jobs? Uh-oh, uh-oh, we lost you a little. We oh, lost you. We lost you a little bit. Try that again. Can you hear? Okay, I think that might be better. Yeah. Can you hear me? Okay, now. Uh, it's okay. better. Um. Sorry, Zeb. I'm I'm gonna give you like five minutes. Leadership. I'm gonna give you five minutes to okay. drive, and maybe you'll be at a different tower or a different zone because I think what you're about to tell us is a, a really critical piece, Ryan. Yeah. When you or your counterparts in like North Carolina hear about like 11,000 uh, jobs lost. Is that something you guys get involved in of trying to figure out how to put infrastructure in a town or is that not what y'all do? Because you got like, well, you, well, you say you got 4,500 employees under you or something like that. Okay, it was only- I have, uh, I have 45 <laughs> um, employees under me. Uh, and I think the, uh, the job loss in North Carolina, I think was 1,100, maybe 1100. not 11,000. 1,100, 1,100. And, you know, taking off my rural development hat, uh, prior to my appointment at, at USDA Rural Development, I served as economic development manager for the office of U.S. West. Senator Joe Manchin. And we actually dealt with a similar issue in West Virginia back in 2019. We had a paper mill uh, that sat on the border of Maryland and West Virginia uh, that closed. It was the uh, Verso Luke Mill. Uh, and there's about 675 in individuals that lost their jobs. Um, but that that was only the start. Uh, that doesn't include the potential uh, foresters and loggers uh, that would lose their jobs, uh, you know, without having that uh, demand uh, for their for their uh, pulp wood product. Uh, that included loss of jobs with trucking companies uh, to supply the the wood and so on and so forth. And um, and so at rural development, you know, the majority of what we do is enhance. Uh, from anything from enhancing public safety, community facilities. Uh, we have our housing programs. We do a, a renewable energy program called REAP and a few other items. And so we're probably at rural development, we probably couldn't save that paper mill uh, mm. because, you know, a private industry, a private company has the discretion and the ability to do what they're going to do. They can say, yes, we'll stay here. No, we won't. The market conditions won't allow us to stay here. Uh, maybe we need some more incentives. Maybe we need better energy rates. It just all depends. So most of that is outside the purview of, of USDA rural development. But I will just speak on one item that came from the loop mill uh, situation where one of the communities that um, bordered the, the mill where a lot of the employees came from, they received their water and their sewer service from the, the water and, and sewer plant that the mill physically ran. Mm. Uh, you know, the mill supported the mill, but then also the community around it. And so when the, when the plant closed, it was a big uh-oh moment to figure out what they're gonna do with water and sewer service. Uh, and so I believe uh, rural development at that time, in addition to US economic, the US Economic Development Administration stepped up to the plate uh, with some grant funding to help that community tie in to the nearest public service district. And so we can provide sort of those wraparound services when a situation like this happens. Mm -hmm. uh, our rural business development grant program that can be utilized to support workforce, you know, uh, a retooling or, or retooling of the workforce. Uh, we could work with a local community college. Uh, they could utilize our rural business development grant program put on some sort of workforce development program to help retrain the impacted uh, employees from that closure. Okay, Zeb, are you in a better spot now? I am, can you hear me okay? 
Yeah, that that sounds perfect. Yeah. Uh, so well, I, I I got I got corrected. It's not eleven thousand. That's the good news. It's all, it's eleven hundred. That's still really bad news. Uh, tell me what eleven hundred people are going to do if this mill actually closes. Well, it is actually closing. Uh, there's rumors, uh, but today I confirmed again that come June, uh, majority of these employers uh, will not have a job. And you know, this really goes to our heart and soul. I mean, we are a blue collar town. And so when you hear, when I have to hold mill workers with tears in their eyes because they've lost their job or hear about kids breaking down in school because they're afraid they're going to move away, uh, there's not, uh, in the mayor's playbook, uh, there's not a page for that. And again, I mean, and Ryan spoke, you know, I'm perfect on two points. Uh, this isn't just 1,100 workers. Uh, the, the, this is not ripples. These are waves. Uh, talk with Governor Cooper. This is a Carolina crisis, not just a Canton crisis. Mm -hmm. uh, and so it is throwing our economy, um, you know, completely out of whack. But it's our job to make sure it doesn't become a black hole uh, that, you know, more, more towns get wrapped up in. But also, just like the town uh, that, uh, that was referenced, our water and sewer uh, is being treated inside the mill. So now we are trying to find funding. Uh, they have promised and, uh, and obligated to run for at least two years, but now we have to build a brand new wastewater treatment plant uh, on top of a budget that just took a $3 million hit to it. So at the same time I'm losing services, I have to find ways and monies and grants to rebuild wastewater. Uh, and so we're, this is this is damaging on all fronts, but it really this this goes you know, really to our heart and soul. I mean, there is no one on earth that remembers this place without this paper mill. Uh, it's over 115 years old. Uh, it's always been part of us. It's who we are. Uh, so right now it's, we have to work on finding these uh, men and women the opportunities for jobs, and then uh, come shutdown, uh, trying to rebuild our economy. But at the same time, not trying to get too far away from what we are. Um, I don't want to be just a tourist town. For America to work, you have to make things. And so we're trying to find other manufacturers, uh, other things that can come in to help with these jobs. But that's not going to be easy. And it's certainly not going to be quick. Right. And I mean, I, I guess I'm, I'm, I'm really kind of sitting here thinking if you've got to build a new wastewater treatment plant, and you've got 1,100 people which are about to lose jobs, which are the tax base. This causes a whole nother level of conundrum, right? Mm -hmm. It does. And so luckily, I mean, we've had you know, great relationships with the state and federal government. Uh, we suspect we'll have a fair amount of money to sustain ourselves for the next several years. Uh, yeah. But I can't live off the government for the next decade. We have to rebuild this economy uh, ASAP. And so hopefully we'll work with the mill. You know, they're not interested in finding any other manufacturing partners to come in. So, you know, I think we'll look at developers uh, and it will be mixed use. But at the okay. same time, then you're talking about affordability. Uh, you know, you know, Asheville is 20 minutes away and it's growing. But again, it's the classic example. Someone from Asheville, it may be affordable to move to Haywood County. But what about your workforce? What about the people already here in Haywood County? You know, uh, it is, it's all tied together in affordability and something else that, I mean, it connects. And again, the reason I'm honored to be part of this call, it's a matter of respect. It doesn't matter if it's healthcare. It doesn't matter if it's affordability to housing, loss of manufacturing. Uh, what gets me going is once again, it's a lack of respect for these blue collar workers, Democrats, Republicans, different socioeconomic backgrounds. Uh, I mean, this is just tearing us up uh, across the board uh, and you're losing more than just jobs. I mean, th these stories, these people, their struggles, their successes, they matter. Uh, and to be put in a situation, I basically have to fight for our survival and our soul uh, because the company out of nowhere said we're shutting down. Uh, it's, it's, it's stressful. It's mind boggling. Uh, it makes me angry. But also, it is what it is. I have to find a way forward, and we will. Uh, but it's certainly not going to be easy. Right, um, Alexa, what are you thinking about this? How does the is the National Rural Health Association been thinking about this, talking about this? Regulatory Affairs been looking at this for any way. 
So I think this is something that a lot of, that we talk about in terms of a parallel situation, which would be hospital closures. Um, one big thing top of mind all the time is the rural hospital closure crisis. And it's been picking back up as we're seeing COVID relief funds that really helped those hospitals stay open from 2020 until now run out. Um, there's been, I think three closures. Um, it might be up to five this year. Some of them are converting to a different type of hospital. But it's the same story in those communities, right? Where the hospital is the biggest employer in that rural town. Um, everyone works there or knows someone who works there or has some um, connection to that hospital. And so when it closes, it's very devastating. Um, so that's what came to mind for me is that I think this is a story that a lot of rural communities can relate to in one way or another. Um, the way NRHA sees it a lot is, you know, those hospital closures. I mean, I'm also thinking about how, you know, job loss in any sector is affects health. You touched on the mental health, behavioral health aspects and the stress that comes on from um, losing jobs. But let's also think about people who lose their employer sponsored coverage. Um, or, you know, they didn't have employer sponsor coverage, but now can't really afford to pay for insurance anymore, making sure that they're transitioning to something like Medicaid to get their needs met. And if they're not, they're stuck in this um, place where they had the care disrupted, potentially um, just can't see a doctor, can't get preventative care. And at the end of the day, loss of coverage just leads to worse health outcomes. And for rural um, populations specifically, they're more likely to be uninsured or underinsured to begin with. Well, I mean, I think like uh, we we just expanded, North Carolina just expanded Medicaid. Do I remember this correctly? Because if I got yep. 11, if I got 11,000 and 11, yes. I'm wrong, I could be wrong there too. Um, but, and so I guess, I mean, are they gonna, Zeb, I'm, ba I'm coming back to you now. Are they gonna buy the employees out? I mean, are they gonna, I mean, I, I'm sure it's not a golden parachute, but are they gonna get a copper yeah. one? Well, I was with the governor Thursday at a union meeting, and even though North Carolina is a right to work state, uh, we have a union uh, and it, it does an amazing job for what it has uh, legally to work with in our state. And, you know, again, some of the severance um, is not, you know, it could be a worse situation. The union just negotiated some buyouts. But the number one thing that keeps coming up is exactly what you just said, health care. Uh, and the rising costs. I mean, we listened to a heartbreaking story about a woman, the governor and I, about the insulin. You know, and COBRA is not cheap. Uh, and so I think the healthcare component of this, because this, these were workers that had their families on their health care. Um, and, you know, again, it's, it's just going to exponentially uh, increase the problems that we're seeing, just as if, if these people hopefully find jobs in the job market in Western North Carolina and don't have to leave the county because if they leave the county, it's exponentially going to make things worse. That's people out of your churches, your schools, you know, your, your athletic fields. Uh, it just, there's so many moving parts, but back to the healthcare part, I want to mention, you know, we had uh, the town host the job employment fair just a week and a half after closing uh, that we put on, uh, our assistant town manager and our CFO as a, as a labor of love didn't even ask. They just did it. And it was held at a church. And not only was it the first. Uh -oh. About 100 employers across the region, but mental health was there. Financial health was there. And that's one thing that we're. Is that, you know, when you had to come home and tell your, your spouse, your children, you didn't have a job, that mortgage payment that medical payment on your counter this, that didn't care. Uh, I'm worried about suicide. Uh, uh -oh. ...component to this and getting through the uh, stigma. Um, so, but uh, we're seeing mill workers line up and get the help they need. Uh, but uh, yeah, the healthcare part is a major component we're working our way through. And so let me ask you, Ryan, I know it doesn't sound like you do this, but I'm going to ask you if you do this anyway. So, so folks, is there a, an, um, not just an economic development, but like actually maybe vocational rehabilitation, because some of these folks may need kind of new job skills or, or other job skills. So I don't know if that's something USDA has in its portfolio, and I, and I know you're in West Virginia, but 
I think that your counterparts in North Carolina is what I'm thinking about, or just sure. overall. Yeah, we so um, and and Mayor, uh, have have you been in contact with a uh, gentleman, State Director Reginald Spite Spate? He's the State Director for North Carolina for USDA RD, um, and if he isn't involved uh, in in this crisis, um, you know. I, I would recommend that you reach out to uh, the state director and I'm happy to facilitate that connection to see uh, what potentially USDA rural development could bring to the table. I know you mentioned the uh, the, the water sewer situation um, through our water and environmental programs. We do have um, grant and direct loan funding uh, that could be used for uh, building a, a new water system or tying in with the nearest um, water system as well. So, um, but so I, I'll I'll go back to the rural business development grant program. It's probably the most flexible program that we have uh, in rural development uh, when it comes to economic development, job creation, job training. Uh, you know, it. This is a. Uh, you know, you take away paper mill and, and plug in coal mines. Uh, this situation has been happening in West Virginia for, uh, you know, 10 or 15 years. Uh, the closure coal mines, uh, the and it's it's uh, there, there's no quick fix, unfortunately, uh, but you learn to transition. Uh, you, you identify your assets and you build off your assets because it's a lot easier uh, to build opportunities from the ground up instead of waiting on, let's say, the white buffalo uh, to wait on the, the next Toyota plant that may or may not come or the, the next manufacturer plant of, of X, Y, and Z that may not come. Uh, so uh, sort of write the book yourself, you know, write, uh, create opportunities from the ground up, utilize your, the assets that you have in place and, and build upon those. Uh, you know, we in Southern West Virginia, we have something called the Hatfield McCoy Trail System. It's probably our biggest uh, recreational tourism asset in, in West Virginia. And we've really uh, taken advantage of that to help, you know, create some jobs, but definitely not ones that we might have lost throughout the, uh, the downturn in the, the coal industry. Um, but to go back to your question, Tony, our Rural Business Development Grant Program is flexible enough to where you know, the uh, whatever community college serves that portion of North Carolina, uh, they could work with the local economic development authority uh, and some job, uh, some current employers there uh, to really do some, some job retraining uh, to get these folks uh, uh, ready for jobs that may uh, be on the horizon. And I will say just from past experience, it's, sometimes it's the little things. You take a mill worker that's been in that job for 20 or 30 years, they probably have no idea how to actually go out and job hunt. You know, a lot of it's done online now. Actually, how to put pen to paper or, you know, fingertips to keypad and, and update their resume or develop a resume. So it's small things like that that could really go a long way uh, in situations like Mayor Smathers is, uh, is dealing with in, in Western North Carolina. Mm. And uh, Alexa, what about the National Rural Health Association? What resources are there? What tools are there? So um, at least from my, the government affairs team's perspective, um, we like to get our members or anyone who's interested involved in advocacy. So largely um, when it comes to advocating for these kinds of resources, like Ryan's talking about the different programs through USDA, for example, this year is a farm bill reauthorization year. And it sounds like, you know, farm bill has nothing to do with health. There's actually a lot of health and community development and capacity building aspects in the farm bill. So this year, um, we're doing some advocacy around the farm bill and different programs that could, you know, help keep hospitals open or attract families to move to rural areas. Um, because that tends to be an issue when, you know, there's a physician who wants this job, but there's potentially nothing for um, the, their partner to do in the area. 
So um, through our farm bill advocacy, we're trying to get our members involved um, through advocacy campaigns, reaching out to their elected officials and talking about, you know, what kind of programs would be beneficial for that for their communities and why they need to be funded or reauthorized um, and hopefully reauthorized at increased levels um, of funding compared to the last farm bill, which was five years ago. Um, so from the government affairs team, we just try to put out advocacy resources, education resources to let people know what's out there. Um, and because it's the farm bill year, like I said, we're trying to break into that space, learn a little bit more about the USDA programs and how they can benefit rural health um, and rural communities. Perfect. Thank, thanks a lot. Um, uh, and I and I did, I meant no uh, disrespect, uh, Mayor uh, Smathers, by calling you Zeb by your first name. I apologize for not using your. your I've been I've been called much worse. I've been called much worse. Don't worry. So. <laughs> <laughs> well, then that would be that would be you and I both. Um, so here's another yeah. question I have for you: What can people like us, like community education group, but like other advocates, do around the country? A, to bring attention to this, B, to be helpful, and then I think C, and to not be uh, obtrusive and get in the way. But, you know, I think that there, there, there are groups out there like this is in our wheelhouse, but I think that this is going to have a, a, a ripple effect of untold proportion, right? So how do I help? What do I do? Well, I mean, this is different than a flood. And what we saw two years ago, you can send water, you can send money, but let's call this Monday, let's call this Motivation Monday at this point. Everybody on this call and on the middle of an afternoon on a Monday, coming off of a holiday, you care enough to be on this call. And so it may be fate that I'm on this to tell you this and you need to hear this. The work you're doing in every single aspect as it connects to these areas that we live and work and believe in, you are doing the Lord's work. We have to be successful in these realms. In North Carolina, there's more Cantons than Charlottes. I know where the money, I know where the people are, but if we're really going to make a difference in these states and this country, it's these communities. Don't think for a second what you're doing is not important. It is the most important work. Because if we're not succeeding in these areas, if we're not growing these areas and valuing these areas and giving them the respect they deserve, then what are we doing? I mean, this is the calling, I think, for so many. Uh, and we just can't have all of our, our, our wealth and our health and our brains concentrated in, in areas in these large cities. But even in large cities, they're made of small towns, boroughs, suburbs. But guys, don't think for a second what you can do to help me Yes, you can send resources, you can send me ideas, but you can double down on what you're doing to make a difference because this is going, there's going to be another paper town closure. There's going to be another health crisis. There's going to be another hospital close. Our job is to shrink those numbers and give these people the respect they deserve. Well, thank you. That was, um... That was a very powerful message, you know, because like I said, I think a, a part of why I wanted to have this conversation is because I, I do think that these things are linked. And I think that we don't often link them. You know, uh, one of the things we try to do here is to what we call deconstruct the silos, which all these things exist. Rural health care, rural hospitals, substance use, HIV, hep C, mills closing, employment, vocational rehabilitation, vocational education, rural development, farming, black farmers, white farmers, farmer. We try, we try to say that, you know, there's so many people often off working in these little groups, but it's really important that we kind of talk to each other and know what the other person's doing so that we can be of support because they're all linked together in one way, shape, or form. Um, and so, Ryan, let me ask you this. What is the, what are the, because I'm, I'm imagining that it's more than one, but what are the, the big 2023, 2024 priorities for your, Rural development uh, brethren and sister in. I don't know how many are female and how many are male. So. 
<laughs> well, we have a pretty good mix of our, our state directors. Um, I believe uh, they are the majority female um, uh, at, at USDA Rural Development, our uh, state directors. So the uh, from above, we have some priorities at USDA, including climate change, tackling climate change, creating uh, new and better markets for farmers to sell their goods, open up new markets. Um, but I'd say mainly it's getting a lot of times folks don't know what they don't know, especially in small rural states like West Virginia, where we don't have a, a, a city now over 50,000 in population. So we are a state of rural, we are a state made up of small towns and rural communities. And sometimes our, our mayors, our uh, local development boards, they just don't know what they don't know. And so getting the resources uh, and the knowledge into their hands so they know, hey, six months from now, there'll be a program uh, that opens uh, to potentially help you buy a new police car um, or the local small independent hospital to potentially utilize our community facilities uh, program to do an expansion. Um, and it's it's really getting the knowledge into the hands of the folks that need it. Uh, the, the administration recently rolled out uh, around this time last year, the Rural Partners Network, uh, which is an all of government approach uh, to bring resources into historically underserved communities. Uh, right now, uh, RPN is in 10 states, West Virginia being one of those. Uh, and depending on the results of the farm bill and the, uh, the next budget bill, uh, that program may uh, expand to other states. And so uh, what we're doing is we're bringing the, the resources to the people. Instead of a, hey, call us, we're going out to you. Uh, and so I have, we have two community networks in West Virginia that represent 20 counties, um, 70 municipalities, and about 400,000 people. And so I have three community liaisons that their sole job is to connect with the stakeholders in these communities to say, well, A, to, to see what their priorities are. You know, like I said, opportunity from the ground up. Yeah. What their opportunities? What what are their priorities? And how can we help? Not only as USDA RD, but all the other participating departments and uh, and commissions under Rural Partners Network. And like I said, there's more than twenty everywhere. Everything from yeah. USDA RD, Appalachian Regional Commission, uh, DHHS. I mean, the alphabet soup of federal agencies are more than likely represented in a rural partners network. So I'd say my one of my priorities is making sure the knowledge of what's out there gets into the hands of the people that need it. So uh, you said, you mentioned ARC. What, so what, and, and I guess uh, Mayor Schmathers, I'm gonna come with you to, um, uh, let's see, I'm not gonna forget you. I'm gonna come back to you too. But I wanted that you brought up the uh, ARC um, so I'm wondering, kind of, maybe, Mayor, you could tell us, is ARC playing a role here? What's Is ARC kind of ponying up some resources uh, in emergency? Uh, what, what's going on there? Absolutely. The ARC has been wonderful. Uh, from zero hour, uh, they have been involved, uh, not just with money, but again, respect, innovation, uh, having them at the table with these resources. Uh oh. Uh oh, we lost you again. Uh oh, we, lo we lost you again. Let's see if you're back. You there? Let's try Maybe. again. There you go. You that there? sounds better. Yep, sounds better. Yes. Yeah, I, thought, I thought the internet was bad in North Carolina, down here in Georgia. Wow. <laughs> so, uh, uh, but ARC has been great. I couldn't ask for a better partner. Uh, and so I, they'll continue to play a major role. Well, we uh, we really we really really like uh, ARC and think that they're doing um, you know some of the most important work I think that um, that we've seen uh, in a minute coming out of there. Uh, and so Alexa, what your relationship to everything that kind of Ryan said? Can you tell us a bit about kind of bigger, broader? what maybe some of the National Rural Health Association programming is looking like, not just in the kind of uh, emergency response spaces, but training, education, health, other things, anything you want to tell us about 
what it is that you guys are doing. Yeah, I can talk about some of our um, advocacy priorities for this year. So I already referenced Farm Bill. That's a huge one for us. Um, How big is the Farm Bill? How much is in the Farm Bill? Oh, I Ryan might know the answer to that. I don't know exactly how much. Yeah, I we, there's 12 different uh, titles within the mm -hmm. Farm Bill, uh, and rural development is only one of those titles. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I'd do a disservice if I threw out a number. <laughs> Yeah, as would I, because we focus mostly on rural development, um, also a bit into the nutrition title, focusing on how um, food security is related to health and health outcomes. Um, we're also looking at broadband programs within rural development, uh, because with the onset of telehealth really kind of propelled um, because of the pandemic, it's a really great resource for rural residents. However, if there's not broadband capacity in an area, then telehealth kind of becomes pointless or isn't as much of a tool for them, right? Um, so there's some broadband programs that we're supporting in there. Um, some Ryan referenced the community facilities program using that, um, finding ways for hospitals to be able to use that to replace outdated infrastructure, um, just other much needed um, updates that they may not be able to do otherwise, especially for hospitals that have, you know, let's say an outdated electronic health record system or something like that. Um, so those are different programs in the Farm Bill that we're supporting. Of course, we're always thinking about workforce. Um, across the board, workforce is an issue in healthcare, um, especially in rural areas. Recruitment and maintainment is especially hard. Um, so there's a bill we're supporting right now, the Rural um, Physician Production Workforce Act. So that deals with Medicare graduate medical education and making sure that rural is represented in residency programs and that those hospitals that have rural residency programs have um, the resources to actually support the residents and be able to train them and have the also the workforce to train the residents, right? Because it's one thing you want to get residents into the pipeline to becoming uh, eventually physicians, right? But if there's no one to train them, then that's also an issue. Um, so workforce is always top of mind. And then I would say supporting rural hospitals. Um, mm -hmm. There's several hospital related bills, you know, with maybe just administrative fixes that will make it easier for a hospital to stay open um, without some regulatory barriers. So we're always thinking about ways to keep hospitals viable. Well, let me ask you all of this, and maybe you know, maybe you don't know. Opioid settlement dollars, are they coming into Canton, Mayor? They are, uh, but I mean, the way the whole, it's been structured, we're not gonna receive a whole lot of money. You know, what I've been telling people about, I mean, I, I get paid nothing to be mayor, so I can't quit my job as an attorney. I'm a local, you know, small town attorney. But, you know, make no bones about it. What we're seeing with workforce is tied to opioids. And we have a lost generation of people, you know, in our, our you know, products of our churches, our schools, and the opioids have put many of them in the grave. And many of them to a situation where they're just handicapped with the ability to work. And that is having an effect, especially with people moving in rising costs. So we are going to be using some of the funds to sort of balance law enforcement and emergency services, uh, the loss of revenue that we have from the paper mill. Uh, but again, uh, you know, I'm seeing even personally, I'm seeing, I'm seeing opioids sort of people move away from pills, but an increase in meth again. And that leads to property crimes. Mm -hmm. uh, and here we have we have a mill uh, that is 150 acres of, of dangers. Uh, and, you know, there's worries about rising crime, homelessness. Uh, again, there's so many angles to this. Uh, but I let, let people know that opioids um, are still around. The effects of it are will be lingering because, again, we have a lost generation of, of people from these communities. Uh, that the opioids have just devastated. Uh, well, I guess that's what I'm wondering. I'm wondering a bit if some of those dollars can't be put to use for, because, you know, again, I, I, I say that I think our response to the opioid crisis has to be every individual, every uh, house, every town, every holler, every community, every city, every state, um, because I think that it's an insidious thing. And I think that the making sure that these dollars get back to those who have had uh, one of the most important impacts, right? 
Uh, one, one of the most important impacts that is to get back to those homes, to get back to those individuals. So, I, you know, I'm wondering if maybe some of those dollars can be reallocated for those programs, put yeah. those folks to use as community health workers, doing outreach, doing engagement, yeah. that kind yeah. of thing. You know, and well, I, I mean, first, yeah, 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 sorry, go first, ahead. Yeah, first off, no, no, first off, I liked you before. I like you more when you use the word holler. That's usually just me on these Zoom calls, but uh, but but no, we we are we have asked for that. Uh, the way it's structured in North Carolina, we actually in, in our communities, the amount that we get from some of these settlements is relatively small. What we've asked though is go back to the Department of Health and Human Services and do exactly what you said. You know, use some of these monies uh, or even money left over from the flood. Uh, you know, the unmet needs uh, because you know it, it's all connected. Uh, it, 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 it really is. And again, to the people listening, you know, whatever work you're doing in these communities, it's tied to something else. And if you're not approaching it, if you're not fighting it on sort of a connected front, you're missing the opportunity. So absolutely, we've, we've asked uh, for, we've asked for money from a lot of people, but we have asked that some of the opioid money uh, could be sent to us in connected but different ways. Um, hey, we does um, uh, what's his name that I'm thinking about? Uh, Danny Scalise. Uh, the, how far is Danny from Canton? About an hour and a half. Uh, so we're we, talking about Burke County here. Got it. Got it. Right. So maybe maybe we can put Danny and the, and the mayor together. Uh, just because Danny is kind of dancing with those uh, opioid settlement dollars down there. Uh, and I think, I mean, not that you don't know uh, all of that, but I like to put together the people I know that are doing something yeah. and, and they're doing it right and well. Um, well I, I do what, I do whatever Lee tells me to do. <laughs> <laughs> and so do, and so do I most days. Yeah. Um, and so I, I think, cause I think that that is one of those other things uh, and Ryan, are you guys, I mean, you're the, you're the government. So, uh, but are you guys kind of helping people shepherd opioid settlement dollars? Are they coming to you with questions about opioid settlement dollars or anything like that? No, honestly, uh, it's, it's not really something we get involved in. Uh, I think the mayor mentioned in West Virginia, to my understanding is a lot of those settlement dollars go directly into our, uh, DHS. Um, and then they are utilized for addiction recovery, uh, things of that nature, because as you all alluded to, you know, addiction, opioid addiction, it's, it's a, an illness that does not discriminate, uh, you know, doesn't discriminate on any socioeconomic boundaries. Uh, it impacts everybody. Uh, and, and I'm sure everybody's heard the stories of, uh, of Oceana, West Virginia, and, and sort of the pill mills. And uh, there's a great movie called Heroin. Um, that was shot in Huntington, West Virginia, features a uh, uh, former police, uh, fire chief, Jan Raider. Uh, so I encourage everybody to watch that if they haven't. Um, but no, that's not really something we've, we've been involved with. Uh, but um, in West Virginia, I know a lot of it goes towards our DHS. Uh, and then I think some counties also receive uh, a portion of that. And for the most part, it does sort of go right back to fight the uh, to, to fight the addiction uh, issues. Yeah. And how about you, Alexa? Are you What are you guys doing around opioid settlement, if anything? Um, nothing around opioid settlement specifically, but I can talk a little bit about um, what we do on the policy side for opioids generally. So one big thing that uh, we were working on was um, the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration came out with um, a proposed rule back in December that had to do with opioid treatment programs. Um, and I did a bit of an internal analysis because there's no real breakdown on, you know, where are OTPs in rural versus urban. And based on just what zip codes are considered rural, um, only about 220 of those out of a thousand are in rural areas. And I think that's really key to know because opioid treatment programs are the only place that you can receive methadone for opioid use disorder. So think about all the rural communities that don't have access to that um, nearby. So we commented on that proposed rule and it mostly modernized and um, kind of brought 
the opioid treatment programs more into a line with today's kind of accepted standards of practice and clinical standards, um, like allowing prescriptions via telehealth. But we also highlighted how, you know, for this to be meaningful to rural communities, opioid treatment programs need to be located in rural communities. And then another um, big thing on the treatment side was the Drug Enforcement Administration recently put out a proposed rule that um, unless you're in an opioid treatment program, because that's under a different jurisdiction, sure. practitioners can't prescribe buprenorphine via telehealth anymore without an in-person component. So we commented on that and said that that's going to just lead to um, disruptions in care, potentially overdoses, um, and just more poor outcomes because um, using telehealth to get buprenorphine prescriptions was huge during the pandemic. And studies are coming out showing that it doesn't, it wasn't more dangerous or let, it didn't lead to more overdoses, right, than when there was an in-person component required pre-pandemic. Mm -hmm. um, so those are two big things that are moving um, in the federal government right now that we've been doing some advocacy on and just making sure everyone has access to that treatment that they need. Great, thanks. Uh, does anybody else have uh, questions for our panelists? Uh, if you do, you can either raise your hand or put it in the chat. Uh, look at that, Ryan came back from lunch. Just messing with you, man. All right, so nobody has any, any further questions. So, Mayor, I'm going to ask you. It looks like we're going to be we're going to get out of here a few minutes early. And I know I kind of asked you this uh, earlier, but what do you think is going to happen here? Yeah. Well, I think the plant will close in June. Um, we will continue to use workforce resources, federal and state and local to give these employees and their families opportunities. Um, the, the company itself uh, will start removing a lot of the machinery, the valuable materials, uh, the chips from the site. Uh, there's a huge environmental concern. Uh, they have to do what I will be on them to make sure they do what is legally obligated uh, to clean up this site. Um, then I suspect we'll start speaking with them what's next. And this is 150 acres that has natural gas, fiber, uh, mm. rail, highways um, on a river. Um, uh, it's an amazing, Haywood County is one of the few counties in the U.S. all of our water comes within our county. So the settlers, you know, they, they, they settled on this land because of the river. The paper mill came here because of the river. And I suspect uh, it will be the river that takes us into the future. Uh, but I think it will be mixed development. As much as I would love for it to be manu manufacturing, mm -hmm. um, I don't see that happening on this site because of how bad this site has become with maintenance and environmental issues. Um, I see it being mixed. Uh, but again, I think we have to do it in a way that honors the history and legacy of these workers. Um, you know, right now it's the question of how can we still be a mill town without a mill. Mm -hmm. And I think we can I think we can because I think being a mill town, what we pride ourselves on is not so much the machines or the buildings. It's the people. It's the relationships. It's that blue collar mentality of you know getting through the hard times, uh, you know, the importance of a day's work. If that's what makes us a mill town, then we can continue to be a mill town and we can be different. And I don't want to just be another tourist town in the mountains. I want to be something more uh, that brings out our best, uh, which addresses many of these issues, uh, residential, commercial, education, research. You know, I've nicknamed it. We're, we have an opportunity to build a hometown of tomorrow, mm. uh, but hopefully uh, we can make up for some past, um, you know, issues and, and, and really make this an example that brings a lot of people together, uh, socioeconomic, race. Uh, this is an opportunity to do it right and really change the conversation, uh, what it means to be in these rural areas. But again, it's going to be built on a base of respect to what these people have meant to our town and what they continue to mean. And these are the same men and women that we fight for, Democrats and Republicans. Uh, and so that's what I'm committed to. All right. Thank you, sir. Uh, 
Alexa, tell me what the people need to know about what you need from them at the National at Rural Health Association. Yeah, um, so we need the support of our members and advocates like all the time. Um, people may think that rural health is kind of a niche issue um, and we're like the only national group that's completely dedicated to rural health. So we really value um, our members, um, anyone who's interested just partnering with us and working with us on these issues to make sure that our voice is heard um, in DC and make sure that the rural health um, experience is reflected in what's happening in uh, federal policies. Perfect. Brian, I know you are with the uh, government, but tell me what the people need to know about your office or, or the offices in their state. Well, I would say uh, communication is key. We can't uh, potentially assist with an issue unless we know there's a problem. Uh, so I think collaboration and communication are the two of the biggest keys when it comes to um, addressing any type of issue within a within a rural community. Um, you know, tear down your silos, communicate with each other. Um, that is sort of what I tell every stakeholder I come across in West Virginia. I say, you know, I can tell you the information. Uh, I can't assist with, can't help you with it unless I know that the the problem exists. So please communicate with us. Um, you know, and, and to the point that was made earlier, you know, our country can't succeed unless our rural communities succeed. Uh, and so by working together, you know, I think we, any community can, can prosper, but you really need to build those opportunities from the bottom up um, and just work together. Well, I want to, I want to thank the, the three of you so much for taking time uh, out of your schedules to, to chat with us, to educate us, uh, and, to, and to share with us. You know, I, I really just believe that we are at a place in this country where if we don't all work together, uh, whatever that is that we can find as common ground, right? We, we've got so many, many, many areas where we may disagree, but I think that there are areas where we frequently have common ground. And I think the, the idea of uh, 1,100 people losing their jobs, and then you add on top of that the, you know, I, I've never been to Canton, so I'm making this up. It's just, this is what is in my head. But the, the burger joint down the street or the, the flower shop or the bakery or the, you know, what, you know, the car wash, it might even be the squeegee guy who stops you to annoy you to wash your window. I mean, this is going to have ripple effect that we uh, can't, I think, always see ahead of time, um, you know, and I think that that's why I think we are so keen on how do we make sure that these opioid settlement dollars are used correctly? How do we make sure that we're having conversation across whatever lines we think we need to have them to make sure that, again, the families of Appalachia have a, you know, a, a shot. That, I mean, that's what this is all about. We just want these families to have a shot at making it. Um, you know, there's been a crisis after crisis. Um, and I think the only way, again, we do that is if we work together to do it. Uh, I don't have to know the family. I just know they are a family in Appalachia and that's our job. Um, so Again, thank you, uh, Mayor. If you figure out that there's something you can that we can do, uh, let us know. Uh, we're keeping our eye on it. I think I've asked Lee to make an introduction uh, to you to Danny Scalise, uh, who's in North Carolina now, used to be in West Virginia, uh, and is doing some work around that. So might be able to show you how to draw down a couple of more of those bucks or, or something. Um, and I think that I'm going to say, I thought uh, Lancaster had her hand up, but I think she left uh, and nobody's got a question for you. So I'm going to say thank you and give you four and a half minutes of your day back. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. This was great. Thank you.